Now, we now discuss the different kinds of obligation which I enumerated a while ago. We first go to the ob uh, classification of obligation according to the peculiarity of the prestation. Why peculiarity of the prestation? Because its existence, its termination will be dependent upon the happening or non-happening of an event. So, we have here the pure obligation that is demandable at once. It does not depend upon an event. Or the other one, an obligation with a condition or an obligation with a period. Okay? Now, I don't think that you will have any problem with a pure obligation. So, the only problem might be in relation to an obligation that is subject to a condition or an obligation that is subject to a period. In the first place, we have to, again, remember what is a condition and what is a period. A condition or a period like a fortuitous event is also an event. A condition or a period is separate and distinct from an obligation. That's why it is a peculiarity of the prestation. Okay? So do not think that the obligation is the condition or the obligation is the period. The condition, the period, they are both events. What distinguishes a condition from a period is that a condition is a future and uncertain event. When you say uncertain, it may or it may not happen. Okay? Always remember that definition. Why? Because that definition will lead you to what? To answer any question related to the obligation. Assuming that the problem involves an obligation that is subject to a condition. But the first thing that you have to remember, class, as I've said, immediately separate the condition from the obligation. Kasi pag pinagsama mo na siya, mas malilito ka na. Always remember condition, event to, event, event, event. It is not an obligation. Okay? Now, what makes a condition different from a period, para madali nating ma-recall, ang period, event din siya, future din siya, ang difference lang nila, certain to happen. Kahit ano mangyari, talagang mangyayari. So what is an example of an event that is sure to happen? It's always an example by commentators, death. Whether you like it or not, although there is such a thing as a fountain of youth, kahit inumin mo lahat ng tubig mo, <laughs> death is sure to happen. It is an event. Okay? Now, to make it a little bit complicated, we connect the word condition or period with the term suspensive and resolutory. So, suspensive condition. Suspensive period, resolutory condition, resolutory period. Again, class, so that you will not be confused, go back to the basic definition of what is a condition and a period. Condition, event siya, may or may not happen. Period, event siya, sure to happen. So, if there is a qualifying term, suspensive condition since the event is not sure to happen let me repeat in a suspensive condition since the event is not sure to happen the happening of the event will give rise to the obligation dahil hindi siguradong mangyayari yung event pag nangyari siya dun lang magkakaroon ng obligation. But if we will connect suspensive with the word period, go back again to the definition of a period. It is an event that is sure to happen. 
siguradong mangyayari. So kung siguradong mangyayari, the happening of a suspensive period will give rise to the demandability of the obligation. If you will notice, class, the reason why a suspensive period speaks about demandability, it's because we're talking of an event that is sure to happen. Whether you like it or not, mangyayari yan. The only question is when, kailan. Pero siguradong mangyayari yan. That's why it contemplates of an obligation that is already existing, but it is not yet demandable. Nandun na. Hindi lang demandable because it is subject to a suspensive period. On the other hand, if it is a suspensive condition, since a condition is an event that is not sure to happen, pwedeng hindi mangyari. So the happening of that condition will only give rise to the obligation, not yet the demandability. So in other words, if there is an agreement and it involves an obligation that is subject to a suspensive condition, at the time of the agreement, the obligation is not yet existing because the existence of that obligation will be dependent upon the happening of the suspensive condition. While if we are talking of an obligation that is subject to a suspensive period, kaya siguro, di ba, kung titignan nyo sa English, ang period, ano yung period talaga sa punctuation mark? Yun yung pinaka-pinal ng sentence. So talaga, may katapusan. Parang ganun din, by analogy, if you will connect it with a suspensive period, it will really happen. That's why if that suspensive period will take place, the obligation becomes demandable. Demandability is what is involved in a suspensive period because even if the suspensive period has not yet taken place, the obligation is already there. The only question is, when can it be demandable? And its demandability will be dependent upon the happening of the suspensive period. Example, di ba? Sa retirement natin, sino mga nagtatrabaho dyan? Kung may retirement benefits ka, kailan mo po pwedeng makuha yung iyong benefits? Once you reach the retirable age. So you see, the enjoyment of the retirement benefits is subject to a period. And what is that period? It is a suspensive period upon reaching the retirable age. So ngayon, hindi ka pa retirable age, magtrabaho ka muna. But once you have reached the retirable age, you have the right to demand for your retirement benefits. Ano naman yung posibleng maging hindi siya period pero condition sa employment? If you will be declared as an outstanding employee, can that be considered as a period that is a condition? If you will be declared as an outstanding employee, then you will be given the benefit to have a world tour. Ang ganda nun, no? Ano? World tour. But that is subject to a what? Suspensive condition. It's not a period. If your father will tell you, anak, I will give you a condo unit in Wakwak. Ako, Wakwak. O kaya the fourth. <laughs> if you pass the bar exam, is that a period or a condition? So you see, class, just applying it, you will realize it's easy to remember the distinction between a period and a condition. Sino may mga anak dito? Wag niyo sabihin, lahat kayo, ano, singular. <laughs> Hindi plural. <laughs> Di ba sa bata? Ano sasabi mo? Sige anak, bibigyan kita ng ano, ng award pag ano, pag nag-excel ka sa school. So that means you're imposing a condition to your child which is a suspensive condition. Bibigyan kita ng award pag nag-excel ka sa school. 
Okay? Resolutory. Whether it is a condition or a period, the happening of the resolutory condition or resolutory period will extinguish the obligation. At least a resolutory, walang problema. Ang may problema, suspensive condition or suspensive period. Basta huwag kakalimutan, iba ang condition, ang period sa obligation. Kaya nga sinasabi, it is a classification according to the peculiarity. Bakit peculiarity? Kasi hindi mo kagad masasabi, ayun na yung obligation. Yung obligation, its demandability or existence will be dependent upon the happening of an event. Which can be a condition or a period. Is that clear? Okay. Well, regardless of whether it is a period or a condition, definitely, nobody can tell when it will happen. So, during the pendency, something might happen to the thing. This time class, we are using the word object referring to property or thing. And we are talking of an obligation to give. So, what happens is, if there is loss, deterioration, or improvement of the thing in a prestation to give, while the condition or the period is pending. Okay? Now, take note, what is lost in civil law? To a person who has no knowledge of law, loss is simply physical loss. So that is your advantage because you will notice that loss in so far as the civil code is concerned, is not only limited to physical loss, but it also means if the property already goes out of the commerce of men, therefore it ceases to be a property, it becomes a thing. It is simply a thing, not a property. Or its existence is unknown. So example of this, what property now is only a thing. Yung 10 peso paper bill, it's already a thing, not anymore a property. If you will recall in your property, when can a thing be a property? The code there is USA. Utility, substantivity, capable of being appropriated. USA. So, why do we say that the 10 peso bill is not anymore a property? Although there is utility, substantivity, but the last element is missing, it cannot anymore be appropriated. So, in so far as civil law is concerned, that 10 peso bill is already considered as lost. Okay? So, we have to find out, let's first talk about loss. What happens to the obligation pending the happening of the condition if the object or the property was lost? You have to make a qualification if the problem does not mention whether there was fault or there was no fault on the part of the debtor. Why? Because under the civil code, if the loss is without the fault of the debtor, his obligation is extinguished. But if the loss is with the fault of the debtor, he will be liable for damages. Now, if you will try to analyze it, class, with or without fault, it will only boil down to loss referring to physical loss, isn't it? Because going outside of the commerce of men, that will be dependent now on the part of the state to declare it as outside of the commerce of men. If you will try to analyze it carefully, so it's more of a physical loss. And if that physical loss is without the fault, of the debtor, then that means the obligation is extinguished. But if it is with the fault of the debtor, he can be liable for damages. Next, in case of deterioration, usually this will happen if, for example, the property involved is consumable. Diba yung mga prutas? So deterioration if it is without the fault of the debtor, creditor will have to bear the impairment if debtor has no fault. But if debtor has fault, then creditor has two options. What are the options? Rescission plus damages or fulfillment plus damages. And then finally, improvement. 
So, kung halimbawa ang involved delivery of a farm is subject to a condition. So, kung nagtanim ka doon na munga, that will be considered as an accession. Improvement. What happens? If it is improved by nature, it will benefit the creditor. But, if it is at the expense of the debtor, then you apply the rules governing usufruct. And what are the rules governing usufruct? What is the right of the usufructuary? Removal of the improvement. Okay? So, these rules regarding the loss, the deterioration, or the improvement of the thing, pending the condition, this will be the same rules applicable in case the event is not a condition, but it is a suspensive period. Now, I would like to remind you regarding laws, which I also failed to mention when we were discussing for Tweetus' event, the kind of property involved in a prestation to give is also important. I think I already mentioned about specific or generic thing. If what is involved is specific, if there is a fortuitous event, obligation is extinguished. The same rule, if it is lost, pending. But if it is generic, since a genus does not perish, even if there is a fortuitous event, even if there is physical loss, since it can still be substituted. What I am trying to drive at class, although the question has something to do with this provision, do not forget to connect it with other provisions, especially in obligations. Is that clear? So be very careful. Classification of an obligation according to prestations. Individual obligation that only involves one prestation. Do not tie sa multiple, kasi dun lang naman may problema. And under multiple obligation, you have the facultative and the alternative obligation. Class, if you will be asked to distinguish alternative obligation from facultative obligation, the distinction is that in alternative obligation, there are several prestations due. In facultative, there is only one prestation agreed upon, and that one prestation is due. In alternative obligation, the fulfillment of one prestation will extinguish the obligation. In facultative obligation, debtor has the right not to perform that obligation that is due, but to substitute it with another prestation. Now, what is the common denominator? There is choice. Choice to be exercised by whom? Primarily by the debtor. That's why if you will notice class, it only shows that the civil code is pro-debtor. Bakit pro-debtor? Kung titignan mo, alternative facultative, siya may option, especially in alternative. He has the priority to exercise the choice. If he does not exercise the choice, then... It can be exercised by the creditor or even by a third person. But in facultative, the choice only belongs to him. He cannot be compelled by the creditor to make a substitution. Is that clear? Now, of course, the problem might be complicated in the sense that if one of the prestation becomes impossible, will it? extinguish the obligation. If it is alternative, no. For as long as there are other prestations that are due. But in facultative, what happens? If the substitute becomes impossible, it becomes simply an individual obligation. Is that clear? Kung yung kanina, ang pamantayan natin, dami ng prestation, our next classification is plurality of parties. And we have here joint and solidarity obligation. Class, if you will recall any decisions that you have read wherein there is plurality of debtors, take a look at the dispositive portion. And usually, what is the decision of the court? 
Is it joint or solidary? Usually solidary. <laughs> Kung titingnan mo, yung mga plurality of defendants. Kasi favorable kanino? Sa complainant. Why? Because between a joint and a solidary obligation, a solidary is more onerous. More onerous from the point of view of the debtor, but very advantageous from the point of view of the creditor. Why onerous from the point of view of the debtor? It's because although there are several debtors, if it is solidary, only one can be compelled to perform the entire obligation. And under your family code, give me an example of a solidary obligation which falls under here. Law or nature requires solidarity. In your family code, can you remember? Where in the law says, a solidary obligation exists. Under special parental authority between the school, the teacher, the administrator. They are solidarily liable. In torts and damages, diba? under vicarious liability, solidary obligation. So do not forget those solidary obligations as provided under the civil code. Why? Because it's possible the examiner might ask you, give examples of a solidary obligation created by law. Now, joint obligation, this one is favorable to the debtor. Why? Even if there are several debtors, creditor can only demand from him his share. He cannot be compelled to fulfill the entire obligation. That is the reason why if there is no express stipulation as to what kind of obligation is involved, the presumption of the code is it is a joint obligation, not a solidary obligation. So again, this shows that the civil code is pro-debtor. Ang laging pinoprotektahan ang debtor, hindi ang creditor. Kanina sa alternative of facultative, siya ang may karapatang mamili. Dito, pag walang stipulation, anong klaseng liability, ang general rule, ang presumption, it is a joint obligation. Okay? So, take note of the two exceptions, the two cases when there can be solidary liability expressly stipulated and law or nature requires solidarity. Aside from what I have mentioned, other cases wherein the law requires a solidary obligation under the revised penal code, liability among the co-principals, co-accomplices, co-accessories, solidary obligation. Liability among the Baileys, Article 1945, Incomodatum, solidary obligation. Okay, take note of the following rule. When... The object that is involved, if it has something to do with an obligation to give, prestation to give, okay, it is indivisible. And we said what is indivisible is that there can be no partial performance of the obligation. So, kung titignan mo, the indivisibility of the obligation would be better connected if the obligation is solidary. Diba? Bakit? Kasi pag solidary, you can compel one debtor to fulfill the entire obligation. So, walang problema. Indivisible, tapos isang tao lang, he can fulfill the entire obligation. There will be a problem if it is joint obligation, but at the same time, it is indivisible. So, it means, class, that an obligation can have other features, meaning to say, there can be plurality of debtors. At the same time, it can be subject to a condition. At the same time, the performance can be partial or it may not be partial. So, wag niyong isipin that these classifications of obligations cannot coexist simultaneously. They can.
Kaya huwag kayong masyak kung halimbawa, eto joint obligation tapos at the same time pumasok yung indivisible obligation. Because it is a classification based on the quality of the obligation when you talk about indivisibility or divisibility. So, pwede siyang indivisible at the same time joint. Indivisible at the same time solidary. Because the solidarity and joint is a classification based on plurality of debtors or creditors. Okay? So, look at the effect if it is a joint. Pag sinabi natin joint, di ba? Only one debtor can perform his own share. He's not obliged to perform the entire obligation. Pero paano yun? Joint ang obligation, pero at the same time, indivisible. Now, what does the civil code provide? If, for example, one of the joint debtors would refuse to perform his obligation, e eh, sinasabi natin, indivisible then at the same time. So, that means, for that joint and indivisible obligation to be fully fulfilled, there should be what? A common desire of all of the joint debtors to perform their obligation. Paano yung pag-ayaw nung iba? Ikaw lang ang may gusto. E nagkataon, indivisible yung obligation. According to the civil code, it will now be converted into what? Indemnity for damages. So that it can be quantified. So your corresponding share is the one that you can fulfill. Para bang, if A, B, and C are obliged to deliver a horse, si A gusto nang i-deliver, si B and C ayaw pa. Hindi naman po pwedeng i-deliver ni A yung ulo, yung katawan at yung paa mawawala. Hindi ba? Indivisible. So, it will be converted into an indemnity for damages and the share that is now quantified will now be delivered by A. Okay? Ito naman in case of insolvency. Kung si A, B, and C, joint debtors, naging insolvent si A, what happens? Others shall not be liable for his share. Now, let's take a look at the remission. When you say remission, condonation, pagpapatawad. Okay, what is the effect of remission upon a solidary obligation? It depends if it is a total remission or a partial remission. Total remission, walang problema. Lahat ng debtors ay maaambunan ng grasya. <laughs> Wala ng problema. Pero partial, hindi na condone lahat. So that means it will just reduce the amount, and the balance remains a solidary credit. Okay? Now, we go now to another classification of obligation according to qualities. More or less, na-discuss na natin dahil inano natin yung indivisible kanina, di ba? Ito yun. Classification of obligations according to qualities of object. Positive, negative. Na-mention ko na sa inyo, pag positive, performance of the obligation. Negative, you are prohibited. Specific, diba? that is determinate. Generic, that is indeterminate. Divisible or indivisible, whether it can be performed partially or not. So, yung mga installment, diba? yung payment by installment, that is a divisible obligation. Okay? Principal and accessory, that is with reference to the principal contract and the accessory contract. So, general rule, indivisibility, the general rule is that the law presumes that the obligation is indivisible. And if you will notice, you look at Articles 1233 and 1248. Law would always require pay in full, not by installment. So the general rule is that the obligation is indivisible. Okay, exceptions. So take a look at the exceptions. You have Articles 1248, compartly liquidated. Uh, installment contracts, yung sinabi ko sa inyo kanina, yung lalo na ngayon, yung mga bahay, payable by installment, 1720. And if it is partially illegal, okay, po pwede rin yun. But as I've said, these are the exceptions, but the general rule is the obligation is indivisible.
And we have an obligation with the penal clause. Again, class, this will only take place if you're talking of what? An obligation arising from a contract. Kasi wala ata akong nakitang obligation arising from law. Hindi, pwede rin arising from law, di ba? Pag na-late ka ng payment ng income tax mo, may penalty ka. Pero yung sa delic, wala eh, no? At saka sa quasi-delict eh. So usually, it's more on an obligation arising from law and that arising from a contract. And this serves as what? It's like damages, but it doesn't mean to say that you are prohibited from claiming additional damages if in case you will be going to court. Now, what is the reason why this obligation with the penal clause is allowed? At least to put some pressure to the debtor that if you will not be performing your obligation on time, in addition to the principal obligation, this will be your penalty. So that is the purpose of a penal clause.